everyone and welcome to Constructed Chaos. Today we're brooding in the shadows, waiting for our chance to sneak attack as a rogue in D&D 5e. Look, we've all done it. We've all edgelorded a rogue into existence at least once. A character with some tragic past, a propensity for taking lives without remorse, and all the personality of a big metal safe that guards our deepest, darkest secrets because we're the only ones that can pick the lock. I'm not proud of it either, but in playing this class, you may find that this is not actually all the rogue has to offer. Yes, quintessentially, they are Stabby McGee say two words in the dark. And even that has immense value to parties that could use a friend with loose morals. Yet they can also be chatty gamblers that were driven to a life of crime by their debts. They can be knowledgeable wilderness guides and lookouts, detectives that prefer to work alone or even a spy for the local nobility, hoping to snuff out the evils that whisper anarchy amidst crowds of their loyal subjects. As it is with all other classes in D&D 5e, don't be afraid to break the mold and create something atypical. Rogues in particular I've found can be extremely satisfying to turn on their heads. But in saying that, you'll probably still want to have dexterity as your highest ability score, followed by either intelligence or charisma depending on your build. Next, you'll want to give yourself a decent wisdom for better insight and perception checks, or potentially constitution for better survivability. Then you can most often leave strength and dead last unless you have something specific in mind for it. As always, these are just my suggestions for your rogue, and there are plenty of viable builds that prioritize stats differently. Feel free to move things around as you see fit, using this as a good foundation. Now, to get the most juice from the squeeze, you'll want to select a race that grants you a nice bonus to your dexterity score and whatever secondary stat you choose. Typically, elves make great rogues, as do halflings, humans, tabaxi, and even kobolds. Of course, if you're a fan of the custom origin rules from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, then any race can work to your advantage. The rule is optional, I'm just letting you know. I'm not going to put a knife to your throat or anything. As a matter of fact, I don't even have one yet. So now would probably be a great time to go over what we get starting out as a rogue. First off, we'll only have a D8 hit die, but don't worry. That shouldn't be much of a problem with the plethora of evasive abilities this class gets access to. As for gear, we'll begin with either a rapier or a short sword, a short bow with 20 arrows or a short sword, a burglar's pack, a dungeoneer's pack, or an explorer's pack, leather armor, two daggers, and thieves tools. From there, we'll have a starting proficiency in light armor, simple weapons, hand crossbows, long swords, rapiers, short swords, thieves tools, dexterity and intelligence saving throws, and any four skills from acrobatics, athletics, deception, insight, intimidation, perception, performance, persuasion, sleight of hand, and, and stealth. In case you're wondering, that's the most starting skill proficiencies of any class in the game, including the bard. And on top of that, the rogue gets expertise in two of their proficiencies at level one, doubling their proficiency bonus for those skills. No other class does this so early. So you already have a chance to completely rock social encounters or sneak around them easily with something like a plus seven or eight to stealth at level one, turning your D&D character into something out of Skyrim. Who goes there? Show yourself. <laughs> In the wind. And as if that wasn't already enough, your rogue will also get their sneak attack right at the start. This ability is the rogue's bread and butter in combat, so it's important that we understand this correctly. Once per turn, you can deal an extra 1d6 damage to a creature you hit with an attack if you have advantage on the attack roll and if you're using a ranged or finesse weapon. Additionally, you don't need advantage on the roll if another enemy of the target is within five feet of it and the enemy isn't incapacitated and you don't have disadvantage on the roll. There are a few things to note here. First, sneak attack triggers once per turn, not once per round. So it is actually possible to get a second sneak attack if you somehow are able to attack on another creature's turn, like in the case of an opportunity attack. Two, if you have advantage on the attack roll, you get sneak attack. That part is easy enough. Three, the extra damage that sneak attack deals is the same damage as the triggering type. Finally, advantage doesn't stack. If you have a hundred sources of advantage and just one source of disadvantage, they cancel and you have neither and you don't get sneak attack. 
unless the target is within five feet of a creature hostile to them that isn't incapacitated. If the enemy is prone and you're attacking with a bow, that's disadvantage and you don't get sneak attack. If the barbarian is next to the enemy attacking them while prone, you still don't get sneak attack because you still have disadvantage. If you choose to hold your action for the moment your enemy stands back up in order to flee the barbarian because you're a smart rogue and you know that a well-placed shot can make all the difference, good for you. You get sneak attack and a cookie. That's called a snack attack. Now, 1d6 doesn't sound like a whole lot of damage to last an entire campaign but it is quite a lot to start, and that's why sneak attack grows with you. Here's a chart so you can see exactly how much damage you're gonna be getting from those well sought after sneak attacks all throughout your campaign. Now that is some damage. And on top of all that, at first level, thieves can't... Thieves can't do what? <laughs> Thieves can't, as in the secret coded way of speaking that only edgy criminals and in-the-know individuals are able to communicate in and understand. And I'm pretty intentional in the way that I word this, ironically enough, because thieves can't is not a language, nor is it technically something that players should be able to learn without some explicit ruling from the DM or some other feature. It's basically a way of passing messages under the radar, speaking in a natural candor about something unrelated. I often ask my players what their thieves can't sounds like or what they say out loud that conveys the hidden meaning that they want. I tell the barkeep that my favorite color is blue, which of course means that they should carry out the hit on the noble son for the low price of 10 gold and not a copper more because I have to pay for my sick mother's medicine next Tuesday and she could die if I forget, which would ultimately result in the path of righteous vengeance towards the guild of assassins that charges way too much and the terrible economic structure that allows them to drive their prices up as a monopoly since they simply kill off the competition, thusly eliminating the fair access to affordable killings that we should all have a right to as murder hobo citizens. Or something like that. In actuality, something many players and DMs forget is that it takes four times longer to communicate an idea in Thieves' Cant than it would to just speak that idea plainly. Does that mean that you should strictly adhere to that? Probably not, but it is technically correct to do so. Lastly, there are a series of symbols and secret signs that might indicate to a user of Thieves' Cant a certain warning or insight such as a relative danger in an area, the presence of hidden treasure, or maybe even the identity of a fence that will buy stolen goods. So in short, these can't do a lot. Taking even a single level in Rogue grants your character a slew of nice bonuses and proficiencies and lays the foundation for what really just gets even more broken from here. At second level, you'll gain the ability to perform a cunning action as a bonus action each of your turns in combat. This basically means that your options to dash, disengage, or hide in combat get upgraded from a full action to a bonus action instead. Why does that seem familiar? Hey. Yep, this means that rogues get roughly the same features that a monk might have, except they don't have to spend resources like key points to do it. They just can. And this is a theme that sort of continues for most rogues from here. The ability to do cool stuff with no real cap on how often they can do it. It's something that can get easily overlooked, but in a long dungeon or adventuring day, you'll definitely prove to the party that your ability to press on without needing to stop and rest is a force to be reckoned with. Now, just like I did with Sneak Attack, we should take a moment to note a few things about cunning actions. One, dashing increases your speed by whatever your movement speed is in that moment. It does not double your movement full stop. So if you take the dash action and use cunning action to dash as a bonus action with a base speed of 30 feet, you get 90 feet of movement, not 120 feet. Two, though it is a bonus action for you in combat, you cannot simply hide from creatures that can see you. <laughs> what about now? I can still clearly see you. You just put on a second hood. No. And now? No, you need some kind of cover. You can't just hide yourself in your own clothing. <sighs> okay, fine. I saw you go there. You're clearly just under the... Wait, what the hell? Where'd it go? Different DMs may have different rulings about this, but generally it's going to be hard for you to hide in the middle of combat. 
your best bet might be to break line of sight with an enemy by running into another room and hiding, or maybe even turning invisible first. But even that might not be enough at times if the enemy somehow beats your godlike stealth rolls with their contested perception check. Three, what you'll really find yourself doing most often is using the disengage bonus action. This can be extremely useful for getting out of situations where you find your rogue has overcommitted in combat and gotten a bit too close to one or more enemies that could hit them with an attack of opportunity. By first disengaging, you remove the possibility of provoking such attacks with your movement. And just like that, with only two levels in rogue, you'll find yourself in a position within the party that seems to always succeed in the tasks that fall under your purview all while being an absolute menace on the battlefield, so long as you can muster up that sweet, sweet sneak attack. And Tasha's Cauldron of Everything has only made it even easier to do so with the steady aim optional feature that comes online at third level. With this and by sacrificing your movement speed, your rogue is now able to use a bonus action to give themselves advantage on their next attack roll this turn, so long as they haven't moved yet. This really is one of the few abilities in the game that just stays viable throughout the whole growth of your character without the need for changes and upgrades along the way. Plus, it fits right in with the rest of the rogue abilities by having no limit to the number of times you can use the feature. Not to mention that firing arrows from on top of a horse kind of breaks steady aim for always having advantage without sacking your movement speed. It's kind of like True Strike, except actually useful. Wait. Does that mean True Strike actually works for Rogue to help trigger Sneak Attack? Nah, it still sucks. Even if you decide against utilizing this extra cherry on top, the Rogue class sets up an amazing foundation leading into your third level, where we finally get access to one of the available Roguish Archetype subclasses. I'll take some time here to briefly touch on each of these options, but I won't have time to dive deep into every single one, so I'll be sure to link any videos that I create in the future that delve further into the possibilities of the subclasses as I go along. And if you're wondering which subclass I might consider to be the best, look no further, as we begin with one of the first 5e entries from the player's handbook, the Arcane Trickster. This type of rogue builds on the strong foundation we started with by adding one key ingredient, spellcasting. Now, obviously, your rogue isn't going to be as powerful magically as one of their full caster counterparts, but the way the subclass allows you to use these features is just insanely flexible and sometimes outright broken. Notably, you will want to prioritize your intelligence score a bit higher since that'll be where your spellcasting ability comes from, and you'll get to choose enchantment and illusion spells from the wizard's spell list. But slinging spells isn't exactly the only way you'll be making use of your new found magical talents. Right away at level 3, your rogue will gain the Mage Hand cantrip and two other wizard cantrips. But this isn't any old Mage Hand. This is a rogue Mage Hand. That's right, your rogue now has an invisible mage hand that can do all the fun mage hand stuff in addition to being controlled by just a bonus action. And it can even stow or retrieve an object in a container worn or carried by another creature or even use thieves tools at range. If you're keen on some other great ideas for mage hand, just so you can understand how awesome this is, make sure to check out my mage hand guide here. With 100 fresh ideas, you're sure to find at least a few reasons to celebrate this subclass. From there, you'll eventually be able to impose disadvantage onto a creature making a save for a spell you cast if you're hidden. Distract targets with your mage hand as a bonus action for instant advantage, which is basically just a better version of steady aim, and you'll even be able to steal a spell from your enemies once per long rest when a creature casts a spell that targets you or includes you in its area of effect. How's that for pickpocketing? Every single time I play a rogue, I am tempted by the Arcane Trickster subclass, not just because of its broken strength mechanically, but because of its undeniably cool flavor. It's the only subclass that'll give your rogue direct access to spellcasting, and it comes with an invisible mage hand to boot. Next, we have another strong subclass option in the Assassin, though 
This is for a different reason from what you might expect. As it should be clear from the name, this roguish archetype ushers your rogue down a path traveled often by hired killers, bounty hunters, and assassins. To start, this subclass gains some extra proficiencies with the Disguise Kit and the Poisoner's Kit, and you'll gain automatic advantage on attack rolls against creatures in combat that haven't yet taken their turn. Additionally, any attack you land on a surprised creature is considered an automatic critical hit. But this on its own isn't all that powerful, contrary to what it might seem. You see, surprise is actually fairly hard to get in D&D 5e and is somewhat DM dependent since the DM themselves has the ultimate say on what creatures might be surprised or not. Without going into too much detail here, it often boils down to if your party can be stealthy enough not to be noticed by the enemy since, well, you're definitely stealthy enough. So long as the party barbarian doesn't ruin it for you and no member of the party is noticed by the enemy, those creatures are considered surprised when combat begins. At this point, landing a crit with your sneak attack damage at the start of combat is a nearly surefire way to eliminate at least one threat on the battlefield or put a sizable dent into a larger foe. So what exactly makes this broken? What takes it that next step beyond? Well, in a stealthy enough party, one could find a large amount of success by coupling this subclass with some Gloomstalker Ranger and some levels in Fighter. Yes, yes, I know, multi-classing isn't something I often bring up in these class guides, but there aren't many subclass synergies like this one that combine to create one of the most explosive assassins in the game. Don't believe me? Well, maybe you should check out my Ranger Guide too to see what all the Gloomstalker fuss is about. Oh, and this is just level 3, really. The Assassin still has a few tricks up its sleeve as it later grants your rogue the same abilities as everyone else? Look, the Assassin's 17th level ability allows you to double the damage of an attack against a surprised creature independently of a crit, but it comes online fairly late considering that the other features leading up to that mostly just grant small boons to your character's ability to use a disguise kit in a way that isn't all that different from what most DMs allow other characters to do anyway. So maybe now you understand why I put such an emphasis on multi-classing for this one. You can definitely make a great rogue by following all the way through with this subclass, but it doesn't add a whole lot past level three in my opinion. Moving on, the Inquisitive Rogue is built with all the flavor of your favorite rough and tumble detective like Sherlock Holmes or even Batman. You'll probably want to invest a bit more into both intelligence and wisdom with a subclass pick like this so you can make the most of your boons to perception, insight, and investigation that you'll pick up along the way. Bonuses like an automatic minimum roll of 8 on the d20 for insight checks, bonus action perception and investigation checks, and an insightful fighting feature that gives you sneak attack against a creature even if you don't have advantage for one minute all come online at level 3 and you'll get advantage on wisdom and intelligence checks if you move no more than half your movement in a turn beginning at level 9. However, this all can feel a bit less than ideal in most campaigns that don't center around some kind of mystery to unravel. Yes, insightful fighting is definitely a useful feature, but an argument could be made for something like steady aim in its place since it actually gives you advantage in exchange for your bonus action regardless of the one minute long duration. And all this coupled with the 13th level feature that gives your character the ability to sense the presence of illusions can be helpful outside of combat. However, most of these features end up outdone by a spell like Detect Magic or Zone of Truth. And finally, at 17th level, the Inquisitive Rogue is able to utilize their insightful fighting to add 3d6 to their sneak attack damage. But once again, this is showing up so late it feels like bringing a stick to a knife fight. Don't get me wrong, a rogue of this nature can be extremely fun to play in the right campaign, as the flavor alone lends to some super sleuthing. But I would have to ask myself, why not just utilize the flavor alongside another subclass while investing heavily into wisdom and intelligence instead? And with this fresh in mind, we take a look at the mastermind archetype. 
These rogues use information and the gathering of secrets as every bit as much a weapon as daggers and arrows, making them excellent for enabling the talents of your party members without the use of something like bardic inspiration. When you take the subclass, you'll instantly gain proficiency in the disguise kit, forgery kit, one gaming set, and two languages of your choice. And you'll be able to use such proficiencies to great effect as you gain the ability to perfectly mimic the speech patterns and accent of a creature you hear speak for at least one minute. If all this sounds a bit familiar to the subclass features I didn't like from the Assassin subclass, it should. They are somewhat similar and likely not as useful as other features since I think most DMs would allow any character to do this with a decent charisma based check. That said, this is the only feature like this present in the Mastermind subclass and it isn't the only one you get at level 3. Your rogue will also be given an ability that allows the use of the help action as a bonus action instead. True, in most cases I see the help action being used outside of combat, where the delimination between action and bonus action is fairly moot. But I think the subclass makes a fair case for using it in combat more often and fairly effectively at that. As you level up, your rogue will gain abilities that allow them to discern the relative level of another creature's ability scores, force another creature within five feet that's granting you cover to take an attack for you as a reaction, and even give false thoughts whenever your mind is read telepathically or lie successfully when under the effects of a spell that compels you to tell the truth. Now, is this the strongest option for your rogue? Probably not, but it can be a lot of fun with the right group that allows you to gather information about encounters beforehand and give your party the upper hand in the resulting fight. At the very least, I might steal some of these abilities for my next big bad evil guy. Next, we come to one of our newest entries in the Phantom Rogue first introduced in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Fittingly, this option takes some strong inspiration from the Shadowfell as your character gains a close connection to the macabre nature of death that allows them to draw knowledge from those they slay. To start, you're able to draw on the power of the dead by gaining proficiency in one skill or tool that you lack proficiency in each time you finish a short or long rest until you do so again, as well as another feature called Wails from the Grave. This ability allows you to tack on some extra damage when you deal sneak attack damage by sending spirits after another creature within 30 feet of the first. While you can only do this proficiency bonus times for long rest, it scales quite well as it always does necrotic damage equal to half your sneak attack dice rounded up. Just these first two features really play into the established strengths of the rogue as a bit of a skill monkey and a single attack damage dealer in combat, but it gets even better from there. At ninth level, your phantom rogue is able to capture a sliver of life essence from someone who dies in their presence, storing it in something called a soul trinket. These trinkets offer a ton of flexibility as they passively grant advantage on death saving throws and constitution saving throws, allow you to destroy one to attack with whales of the grave without spending a use of that feature, and even utilize a trinket to ask the spirit attached to it one question that it can then answer in a language it knew in life. At 13th level, you can even use those trinkets to perform a ghost walk wherein you become a spectral spirit for 10 minutes as a bonus action, affording you a flying speed of 10 feet, hover, and giving attack rolls against you disadvantage. And at 17th level, your Whales of the Grave get yet another upgrade as you can deal the same amount of necrotic damage to the creature you sneak attack as well as the other creature, and you get a free soul trinket at the end of a long rest if you have none. While the 17th level ability is fairly weak by most accounts, the rest of the subclass works really fantastically with the base rogue abilities and comes free with some wicked flavor, making it one of my favorite options for my own roguish characters. Somewhat blurring the lines between ranger and rogue, the scout archetype presents itself as an option without all the dark and brooding themes presented in many of the other subclasses. As the name suggests, these rogues are often skirmishers and well, scouts in a party composition. They gain proficiency in nature and survival right away when you take the subclass and gain the ability to move up to half their movement speed without provoking opportunity attacks 
as a reaction when an enemy ends its turn within five feet. This second feature alone makes your rogue much less fragile, especially if you're playing a race with a flying speed or if you can somehow maneuver into cover. At 9th level, we'll only get a 10 foot increase to our walking speed, but 13th level sees us gain a propensity for ambushing tactics. Here we gain advantage on initiative rolls and grant advantage on attacks against the first creature we hit during the first round of combat until the start of our next turn. Finally, at 17th level, our rogue gains a second attack as a bonus action. That also benefits from our sneak attack damage if it hits, so long as it isn't against the same target as the first. Honestly, at 17th level, I'd hope for something a bit more than a little extra damage attached to a caveat. The subclass really appears to me to fall off a bit after the initial features at 3rd level. This may be another one worth multiclassing with. Perhaps the monk could make decent use of the mobility provided by the subclass and the extra sneak attack damage. You mean I could have a free cunning action too? Huh? Really? Let me know what you think in the comments. Moving back to the dark and brooding nature of most rogues, we find another one of my personal favorites in the Soul Knife. I mean, you can make magic mind blades to attack your enemies with mysterious psionic energies that couple oh so well with the actual mechanics of the rogue base class. When you discover these abilities at third level, you'll get a set number of d6 psionic energy dice equal to double your proficiency bonus that can be used to fuel your powers and come back after a long rest. If you run out before then, you can regain one extra die as a bonus action once per short or long rest. And trust me, you'll want to be using these dice. Firstly, if you fail a skill or tool check for which you have proficiency, you can roll one of the die and then add it to the check, spending the die only if you succeed. And secondly, you can establish telepathic communication between yourself and a number of creatures equal to your proficiency bonus for a number of hours equal to what you roll on a psionic energy die. This communication spans out so long as each creature is within one mile of each other, and once per long rest, you can do this without expending a die. So the rogue finally has some resources to manage, and really, they only get used up if you succeed. This subclass is extremely powerful already, and we aren't even done with level 3. You can also automatically bring about psionic energy blades when you take the attack action, and those blades deal 1d6 psychic damage, a damage type that is largely superior to the typical piercing or slashing most rogues use. You can even use a second blade after your initial attack to make a bonus action attack on the same turn for 1d4 psychic damage. I can't even begin to stress how cool this is, let alone how practical it can be for a rogue to never be without their weapons. Getting thrown into prison or infiltrating an area where weapons aren't allowed is all made that much more trivial extremely early on in play. And did I mention how freaking cool it is? Then at 9th level, these blades get even better. You'll be able to add your psionic energy die to your attack rolls if you miss, only expending the die if you hit afterwards, of course. And as a bonus action, you can throw one of your psionic blades while expending an energy die to teleport a number of feet away that is 10 times the number rolled. On average, that's going to be as good as Misty Step, one of the best spells in the game. And it could be even better for getting your rogue out of danger, into it, or both. And the hits just keep on coming as you can eventually turn yourself invisible for an hour, becoming visible again only if you deal damage to a creature or force them to make a saving throw, and you can even later stun a creature for a full minute off of an attack. Now, this subclass does fall off a bit at the end compared to other classes overall, but it keeps up an extremely strong pace set at the start through most of your rogue levels. There's way too much here for me to go into every detail about how good it is, but I'll at least mention that the invisibility it grants is even better than the invisibility spell. Make no mistake, this is one of the best ones out there. And we'll follow that up with another solid entry in the Swashbuckler Rogue. You might think, based on the name, that this subclass is limited somewhat to seafaring adventures. But instead, it stands alone as one of the best duelists in single combat. All this 
and a pinch of charming antics. Right out of the gate, you'll gain features that allow you to move away from creatures you attack without threat of opportunity attacks in return, a bonus to your initiative rolls equal to your charisma modifier, and the ability to sneak attack without advantage so long as you are within five feet of your target with no other creatures within five feet of you and no disadvantages. You can likely already see the makings of an excellent swordsman with the ability to freely maneuver the battlefield and set enemies off balance. And this great start only gets greater as you gain the ability to perform a persuasion check against an enemy's insight as an action to either charm them for a minute or give them disadvantage on attacks against creatures other than you and the inability to perform opportunity attacks on creatures other than you. The subclass does eventually begin to fall off a bit at 13th level when you gain the ability to use a bonus action to gain advantage on the next acrobatics or athletics check you make during the same turn. And again at 17th level when you can attempt an attack with advantage once per short rest when you miss another attack. Don't get me wrong, that last feature is definitely a good one that you're bound to use as often as you can, but for a subclass that already doesn't rely so heavily on advantage, and for this to come on so late, it'll probably feel like a miss all the same. Still, don't sleep on this subclass. It's absolutely fantastic and fun in the common levels of play anyway, and the rogue base class can easily carry you through the rest if you aren't feeling a multi-class from there. Now we'll round out our subclasses with the quintessential thief archetype. It's fitting, really, because so many rogues have some level of thief in their character regardless of what subclass they choose. And this subclass drives that home by adding to what rogues do best. You'll learn to use your bonus action for sleight of hand checks, disarming traps, opening locks, or using objects, which does not include magic items, by the way. And you'll take on a climbing speed as well as a more robust running jump that ties into your beefy dexterity score. At ninth level, the subclass grants you advantage on stealth checks so long as you move no more than half your movement speed on the same turn, and 13th level sees you able to make use of any magic items, regardless of their class, race, and level requirements. You'd better hope you have an artificer in the party. Finally, at 17th level, you become able to take two turns during the first round of each combat unless you're surprised. Yeah, you just get to do everything you would have done before, but again, for being an original release partner of the Arcane Trickster in the Player's Handbook, the Thief has held up fairly well. However, much of what it allows for are things that the Rogue would have already succeeded at doing. And with the Fast Hand's ability being clarified as not working with magic items, the subclass feels a little… empty until later levels. But even still, if you want to embody that thief archetype to the fullest and make perfect use of your stealthy pickpocket skills, you'll do well with this subclass. So now that we're done with that, we can finally move past level three to discover what else the base class has in store for us. But first, you wouldn't steal away without liking and subscribing the video, would you? Would you? Fine, I'll reveal my secrets. At level four, the rogue gets an ability score improvement or feat, and they'll get one again at 8th, 10th, 12th, 16th, and 19th level. Yeah, that means you'll even get one extra ability score improvement compared to most other classes, making yourself into even more of a skill monkey with a great spread on your stats. A lot of people forget about that. At fifth level, you'll be able to perform an uncanny dodge as a reaction to being hit with an attack, having the damage that you take as a result. This even works against spells, and guess what? There's no limit to this either, so you could conceivably uncanny dodge every single round. That D8 hit die isn't looking so bad now, is it? Level 6 gives us yet another two expertise skills from our vast pool of skill proficiencies, so we're even less likely to fail on anything. Stealth? Might as well be invisible. These tools? Might as well be unlocked. Sleight of hand? Might as well be ours. Deception? Might as well be true. <laughs> At 7th level, we'll gain evasion, as if uncanny dodge wasn't already enough of a stop hitting yourself mechanic to frustrate the DM to no end. This will allow us to take no damage instead of half damage on attacks that force us to make a dexterity save if we succeed on the save, which, let's face it, we're making that save every day of the week. 
But all that is nothing compared to what we get at level 11. If you thought all of our expertise and proficiencies were getting out of hand, just wait until you get a load of reliable talent. This feature states that any ability check you make that lets you add your proficiency bonus is always at least a 10 on the die. Yes, if you roll a nine or lower on your D20, even the stupid one that looks nice but rolls terrible, that roll becomes a 10 plus like 15 or something, because I don't know, you're a rogue and you deserve success for all the times life itself has failed you. At 14th level, we're able to pinpoint the location of any invisible creatures within 10 feet of us, so long as we're able to hear and... Wait, is that a less than amazing feature? That's weird. At level 15, we'll get proficiency in wisdom saving throws. That's better. And level 18 sees us become so elusive that no attack against us can have advantage unless we're incapacitated. And finally, at level 20, we pushed our abilities for making our own luck to the limits. We can bend reality to our will by changing any missed attack or failed ability check we make into a hit or a 20 on the die respectively. Now. We can only do this once per short rest, so it does fall short on some other capstone abilities out there, but that brings me to my point about the relative broken nature of rogues in D&D 5e. Admittedly, at higher levels, when the full spellcasters are tearing us under the fabric of reality with potent magics, we're still mostly stuck toiling away with the tools of mortals to find success in opening a locked door instead of just blowing it off its hinges with a fireball. So are rogues broken? Well, yeah, rogues are at their absolute best in the tiers of play that most games take place in. They have an uncanny knack for always succeeding whatever they're built for, and they make short work of most enemies they're up against when helmed by players that understand how to pull every situation into their advantage. Simply put, the rogue is almost never going to fail you, and is oftentimes the strongest link in the party's plan for success when they need it most. That's been my experience at least. but. What have you seen or not seen? Be sure to let me know down in the comments and while you're down there, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel for more guides like this one. Now, go out there and make some chaos.